Today's going to be fun. Um, I remind you that this is first and foremost a science class. And so I represent the science side. We have great participants who represent the chef and the cooking side. But uh, today we're going to do both. So last night, when I heard the, uh, the talk, it was fabulous, but it's just great. You're going to love it. But I had all these questions about what was going on. I said, well, let's do some experiments today during lecture. So we're going to do that. Fortunately, we have our secret weapon, which is Daniel. Um, but these are true experiments. I have no idea whether they'll work or not. In fact, I have a strong suspicion they won't, but it's absolutely worth trying. And that's the way we do science. So you'll see how real science gets done. This is real science. Uh, so I'm going to jump up occasionally and say, hey, can we understand something during the lecture? I sort of cleared it with them last night. I think they're going to be interested in it as well. Um, and you'll see what they're doing. And I was just blown away by the difference of, of just the way they mix things. And it really seems very interesting. And I would like to try to understand it. So I'm going to jump up occasionally and say, let's see if we can see something, what's going on. I'll, t I'll tell you briefly what my thoughts are, which may be totally wrong. Um, but welcome to doing real science. Um, I think it'll be fun. OK, so this week, we're talking about um, mouthfeel. So that's an important aspect of cooking and eating and the enjoyment of food what something feels like in your mouth. And we try to quantify that by making measurements on uh, the food that we cook and the food that we eat. So um, we're going to talk about, the, or there's two aspects to mouthfeel. And um, this week, it's the aspect uh, that's the solid, like I'll show you what I mean in a minute, and it's about the elasticity. So texture and mouthfeel really, in this case, in this week, is about um, the elasticity, and the lab then will be uh, measuring elasticity. We'll, under, we'll, we'll discuss how we do that uh, in detail on, um, on Thursday, uh, but in the lab, you'll actually do it. And of course, following the tradition of uh, this class, when we do experiments, we do experiments on something that's yummy to eat. So in the lab, you'll do it on pancakes. On Thursday, on Thursday, I'll just give a little hint of what's going on. On Thursday is the, you know, one of the real treats of this class, and that's uh, Chef Daniel. Daniel also uh, is a chef himself. Not only does experiments, but he's going to do an experiment and cook. He cooks steak, so we uh, get to have pieces of steak, yes. Those of you who like steak, you know, I apologize to all vegetarians, but those of you who like steak, it's, it's a real treat. And uh, we'll not only do an experiment with them, we'll measure the elasticity, but you get to, to taste it as well. Uh, so OK, um, one of the aspects of uh, mouthfeel is how crunchy things are, how they feel when you chew them. Well, immediately when I say you chew them, Already, I'm distinguishing two different kinds of food, right? Because some things you don't chew, you sort of drink or eat. They're, they're, they're not really solid-like. They're fluid-like. Other things like this, like these uh, uh, rock candies, they're clearly very elastic. They're clearly very hard. They're very elastic. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, on Thursday, we'll talk about something that's somewhere in between elastic and not really as hard as a rock candy. Uh, that's steak, and steak, uh, you'll see when we cook it. Uh, one of the things you know, for example, that, um, in fact, let me ask a question. Steak, who here likes steak? OK, about uh, 2 thirds, maybe, half. Now, how do you like your steak? Well done? Medium? Medium rare? Bleu? Red? Rare? Not very many people. OK. Medium rare seems to be the most popular. Why do you, wh when you eat it, it feels different to your mouth, right? OK, that's what we're going to learn about. 
uh, see and learn how to measure. Jello. Anybody know what Jello is? What is it? What are the contents of Jello? Water. How much water? Whoa, that's really tough Jello. It's usually more like 90 or 95 percent. It's water. Is that a liquid? No, it's a solid. Okay, we're going to learn how why. Of course, there are other things that are liquid, and there we still want to understand. You know, water takes, tastes different than a really thick uh, milkshake or a uh, thick smoothie, right? They feel different to your mouth. That's the viscosity. So that we'll talk about uh, the following week, or a week, two weeks from now, I'm not sure. So we know uh, that cooking, uh, we've looked a lot about cooking, uh, cooking an egg. We know one thing that uh, often, but not always, often with cooking, what we do is go from something that's liquid, like a raw egg, to something that's solid, like a cooked egg, or something that's sort of solid but still flows, right? Like the Dave Arnold's perfect egg. Um, and that's a transition from something that's liquid to solid, that's a viscous to elastic. And that's what we're going to discuss today. Um, this is the way to think about how an egg becomes solid. Also, it's how uh, jello becomes solid. Not exactly the same reaction, but the same principle. Essentially, uh, in an egg, it's a lot of water. It's probably 80% water. I, know, I don't remember, 80, 85%, something like that. Um, but it still becomes solid. It becomes solid because it's filled with these proteins. The proteins are all balled up into small little uh, uh, balls at first. That means they don't really affect the uh, elasticity. Then when you cook them, you unfold them, you denature them, they spread out and they're sticky. So they stick to one another. So my, always my analogy to this is you, if you want to get up, you could get up and walk out really easily, right? But what if I insisted that everybody in the room has to hold hands, really not just with, imagine uh, touching and holding hands with more than two people. So you were joined, you were holding his hand, her hand, and his hand behind you. If you could, I know you can't, you only have two hands. But if you could, would you be able to go out? No, right? You're still taking the same amount of space but because you're joined together to all the neighbors, you can't move. And that's what we'll talk about understanding. That's how, the, um, how an egg becomes a solid. The arms become sticky. It turns out that it's not enough just to have two sticking. Some people have to, have, uh, have to, to, to join to three different neighbors. But maybe that's a detail. So how do we quantify it? Well, this is what uh, we'll do in the lab with pancakes. We'll do on Thursday with steak. We'll learn how to look. Really, what is elasticity to you, to when you eat something? Is when you chew something, is how much force you put with your teeth, right? And what does it feel like if a steak is well done compared to if it's rare? You have to put more force. And that's how we'll quantify it, how much force it takes to deform something. That's the way we measure elasticity. And we'll do that on, um, on Thursday. Okay, hmm, those always look so good. Um, coffee and snacks uh, with Jintan and Roni uh, after class, 1.30, outside the cooking lab. If you can come, please do. And... Um, Homework will be posted. It's due on Tuesday. There's one question in today's lecture. Please watch for three facts that seem really interesting to you about Chintan's lecture today. And I saw it last night. There's a million facts. By the way, by the way, I don't know whether the experiments will work today or not, but there's a tremendous project waiting to be done for final projects. I'm going to keep reminding you. I think we'll all keep reminding you about this. And I think these guys would love it if we did something. Tell us what's going on. What is the real reason 
behind the difference between the different doughs that they're going to cook. We'll try and do a simple experiment that we can do in class, but you could do tremendous experiments. We could use electron microscopy, all kinds of really cool things if you want as a project. I bet these guys would love it if we did that. Okay, so uh, let me uh, introduce you to Chintan and Roni. Uh, they uh, are run unapologetic foods. I'll explain it to you. Uh, they, if we had this class just last week, they would have run four restaurants, but this week it's five, and they'll tell you about it. Um, so, guys, it's all yours. I'm going to... I'm going to jump up occasionally to try to do an experiment. All right. Hello, everyone. How are we all doing? Good. So we have more exciting enough, guys. Come on. We've <laughs> got even four hours more for this lame response. <laughs> so we have a rule. When we talk about Indian food, it's a little high energy. So what I really want to see from all of you can we really get some energy in this room? So I'm going to count to three. No, 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 everyone wait, everyone wait, wait. We're going to have to do it right. On three, I'm going to count to three, and I'm going to hear a really loud cheer. Can we do that? Okay. One, two, three! Now I know I'm in Harvard. Now that feels right. I see a few people on the stairs. If you guys want to... Feel free, grab a seat. Up to you guys, if you are more comfortable there, totally fine. Um, feel free. So, how many freshmen in this room? Undergrad? Okay, sophomore? Juniors? Seniors? Um, not from Harvard? Okay. <laughs> All right, so it's a pretty mixed crowd. Um, my name is Ronnie. I'm here with Chef Chintan, and together we run Unapologetic Foods. Um, I am the business side of the operations, he is the food scientist. This is the guy, this is, he runs the R&D, all the madness, that's what he does. I have the fun of actually eating and sometimes going out there doing business deals. So, what I'm here to talk to you guys about is really putting a context to what we're really going to do an experiment on and then discuss. Now food, without context, is flat. Because we don't really understand the narrative of why we're doing certain things. And what we have to first understand, these contexts are built by our own perceptions. The reason our company is called Unapologetic Foods is because the truth is, for far too long, as Indian cuisine, we have been apologizing to the whole world. We have been apologizing to you saying that our food is sometimes too spicy. So when you show up, I'm going to ask you, would you like it mild, medium, hot, Indian hot? What would you like? And these are the little terms that get thrown around. Sometimes the food has a little layer of oil on top, as if it's a crime. Not a storage mechanism, not a way to actually preserve the dishes before refrigeration existed. None of these things come to mind. What we see, well, is it healthy? Is there, you know... No, but we can have a pool of butter and it's totally fine. But the moment we see that oil, we come to you and we say, I'm so sorry, let me take that out for you and let me just clear it up so it looks absolutely pristine. The truth is, our cuisines have existed for centuries. And there's a reason why we eat the way we do. And unfortunately, in this country, most of the representation of Indian food that we have seen has been a very version that's called generic and we have seen that with ethnic food throughout the entire nation and around the world. Ask yourself, have you heard of red curry, green curry, yellow curry in Thai food? Go to Thailand, ask someone, can you make me a red curry? They're gonna laugh, and we're all laughing. Because we understand that difference. Ask my mother how to make a chicken tikka masala, the very dish that supposedly represents our entire cuisine. She has no idea, we heard of it when I moved to this country in 1996. And she still asks me, what is that? Because no one is actually cooking these dishes at home. How we eat at home, each of these cultures are distinctly different than how we have decided we would like to represent our cultures to all of you. What we have done 
it shattered that wall and said, welcome in. Welcome to our homes and see who we really are. Our meat is on the bone, our fish is on the bone, our, you know, there's spices in our food and it's totally freaking okay because you're gonna love it just as much as we do. It's a preconceived notion that actually holds us back. It tells us that it's not okay because for a very long, yet not that long time, in modern history, we have established European cuisine as the baseline for what food should be. We're all smart enough to understand that we can't define all cultures around the world with a whole different baseline that doesn't really have context to the cuisine. But that's the reality. That's what's been really going on. So each time we are trying to measure up to another cuisine, we're failing. It's like that fish climbing a tree situation. It's not happening because the very construct of our cuisine doesn't exist within those certain realms. There's a big difference between Western and Eastern food. And when I say Eastern, I'm talking Asia, I'm talking Thailand, Singapore, Bangkok, you start naming it, all of these countries. What it really means is one, Western food, and there's a, West, a Washington Post article you can find on this. Western food is defined by complementary flavors. So when you have a buttery, softer fish, you're going to use a softer, lighter sauce because you want the fish to shine through. Eastern food is about conflict. We just love that. So what that means is sometimes when we get a soft fish, we blast that with spices and we create this entire explosion in our mouth. But now imagine somebody who's programmed to believe that that's wrong. And that's what I mean. Flavors, in many ways, have defined the very ways of how we see our self-worth. And I think it's important for all of us to understand that that's not the real world. If you really think about it, one-eighth of the entire planet is having Indian food practically on a daily basis. Then how the heck did that cuisine become something so exotic, so much on the fringes? When and how did that become so? Because we have made it so. That's the conversation. That's what we're here to talk about. So whenever we talk about food, understand that you need to understand the nuances of every cuisine. It's not about just knowing one cuisine, one specific aspect and thinking we have figured it out. It's not about that. Question things, challenge things. It's the very idea of what brought us to this class. We could not be more excited to be here this afternoon and just share everything that we have been doing with all of you. And without further ado, let me present you Chef Chintan. This literally is the trailer before the movie starts. <laughs> <laughs> the movie will start now. <laughs> no, no, guys, thank you. And what Ronnie said is very important. And, you know, something like we always keep on talking about is the context of the cuisine that we are cooking. Uh, what we are doing, how do we respect <coughs> the ingredients. We were just talking to, you know, before this class for an interview and we were explaining that how the resources in our cuisine have been very limited. But we have insane amount of cooking techniques, but where we falter as a country, as a cuisine is that we never documented. So, I saw you on the So, it was actually never documented. And because it was not documented, nobody got the access to it. But as we are standing here, and I'm taking this lecture, one of the things which always guided us and our company is curiosity. And I think that is what you guys are here for. The biggest question in your mind is curiosity, that why is it happening and everything. So what we are going to do today is a very simple experiment. And this is technically used for one of the very common dishes. I don't know if anybody has tried it. It's an Indian food called samosa. How many people have eaten a samosa actually? Okay, and I have to break it out to you that I have never eaten a right samosa in America. It has always been a wrong samosa and I love samosa. Samosa is one of my favorite dishes. And I've done, uh, as a kid I got curious about the samosa. We'll come back to it in a later part of the lecture. And that what guided me to understand what is the key about doing the right samosa. And the key to doing the right samosa or any food right is to understanding the entire science and the philosophy behind it. And it starts with the dough. Basically samosa is, this is a samosa, this is a perfectly fried samosa. Okay, it looks perfect, it's internally cooked properly and everything. And then I'll show you now the wrong samosa. 
So if you see the samosa and if you see the cut portion of it, you can see that the dough is uncooked. And this is what is served across America when you eat a samosa because the actual samosa takes around good amount of time to cook. It takes around 25 to 35 minutes to cook a right samosa. But the ones which we get are fried in five minutes. So it's, it's the entire texture of that dough which defines how a samosa will come out. And if you see on that marker over there, this part. <coughs> so do you see this inner layer? This is what he is talking about. And you see the outer layer, you can see the color difference? That's already crispy. The inner layer is where the problem lies. Yes, and that's what's raw, and that's because it's fried very fast. So actually, uh, Professor, we can do the same, we can do an experiment today where we didn't do yesterday, where we can just fry it at one temperature and show it how it's raw inside. So guys, I need two volunteers to make the dough over here, and then I'm gonna require two more people to roll it out and fry these things. So who wants to come down? Two people, two please, volunteers. Please come, come, come. Come. One. Extra credit for them, Professor? <laughs> <laughs> Only if they cook it right. That's true. <laughs> What's your name? Grace. Grace. Anora. Anora, pleasure meeting you. So guys, we have two bowls over here. Is the exact amount of flour and salt inside this. There are two oils over here. Is the exact amount of oil. And we are gonna make a dough with it. But there is a difference over here. What we are gonna do over here is, I'm just gonna add the oil. You can wear the gloves. That's for you, ma'am. I just want you to mix it and make a dough. Okay. Okay, nothing else, very simple. You have the simple one. Okay. Because you were the first one to raise the hand. <laughs> You'll have a little difficult one. <laughs> But this is the right one. Perfect. Yeah, start, start doing it. Come on. Perfect. Just try to mix it. So what we are doing over here is we are just creating this dough. It's going to be a regular dough. It's got flour, salt, oil, and some cold water. Everything is at a colder temperature. This one also is gonna be everything at the same temperature, colder temperature. But the difference that will lie is we are using a cooking technique which in our language is called khasta. In a European or a Western world, it's called short crust. So this is the difference. And the difference that happens in the short crust is this is oil, but this is called as a shortening. In the technical term, it is called a shortening. Shortening could be any kind of a fat. So it can be butter, it can be a lard. Lard was, uh, the concept of shortening started in 18th century and the primarily used fat at that time was lard. But the same technique was also used in Asian countries, but we were not smart enough to document it. So that's why we never knew what it was. And uh, we used also vegetable fat. Apparently vegetable fat will always give you the best of the best result for doing this kind of a dough. But we are using oil today, just for the reference. Okay. As they're going through this, guys, we want to keep it fairly open and interactive. Sorry, guys, yes, one more question. Jump yes. in. This is not a monologue. Any questions you have, ask me at this point of time, I'll keep on answering as I'm doing it. Yes, sir. Uh, so, I don't know if you guys make naan, it's obviously it is such a big place, and there's so many different types of food that is there in the first place. But I was wondering if there's any discussion if like the type of water that you use in naan has a similar impact to the type of water used with bagels, for example. So is the naan in India different in part because of the water that's there? Got it. So uh, it's a phenomenal question and fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So, how many Indian people do you know, sir? <laughs> we don't count, we don't count. Probably like 15. 15, fantastic. It's a big number, actually. <laughs> uh, if you ask any one of them, has your mother ever cooked naan at home? The answer is going to be no. Because naan as a bread, we eat outside in restaurants. It's not a bread which is cooked at home. And also naan comes from one part of the country. Right. Got it? But it's a very commercial product which is shown in all the Indian restaurants. 
and our group has been fighting this battle to make sure that naan is not our bread. Everything else is like which we use commonly at home. Uh, in terms of water and everything, I think it will always change. And I, I was a part of a team which was trying to create a pizza in Bombay and they couldn't create the right dough with the ingredients which are available at that point of time in India. So they actually imported everything including water and when they created it, it came close to it, still it wasn't perfect and one of the reasons I specified yesterday is because I did one experiment like that was the temperature and the humidity in Italy is different from India, Bombay, where it was done. So the final product was still different with using Italian ingredients. So that will always differ and as a professional, our job is to make sure that we, we address those issues and try to get that product as close to the original one. Yeah. I only ask because naan is the only thing that I've ever ethically failed at making multiple times. <laughs> Please come. So what we are going to do over here now is, like if you see this dough, it's already formed. Um, this dough is already formed. It's done beautifully, mixed together, perfectly done. It's formed the gluten over here. You can see the gluten, it's stretchable. Now we are going to make the second dough, but this dough will be made with the method of khasta, the short crust. What happens in short crust is, you have the same ingredients as this, but the only difference is, we'll pour the oil and we are going to rub it. We are going to rub it. Okay? And you'll see the difference which happens and then we'll make a dough with this. And then we'll also pass around a sample of dough for you guys to feel it, that how different it is with just using one simple different technique to it and then professor is going to put under microscope and enlighten us, enlighten us more. Show you. Okay. So technically the quantities of everything is exactly the same. Yes. It's just the technique. Yes. What? That's an indication that the t-shirt needs to be washed. <laughs> it's not mine, it's okay. <laughs> and I think when it comes down to these kinds of stuff, we take a lot of these shorter steps for granted. What we need to understand, cooking has a lot to do with these every minor little step can impact the final product drastically. That is one of the big things we're about to see. You had a good question. A little louder. I was just wondering, you spoke to have diverse Indian cuisine with me. Is there a specific aspect or like region of India that uh, your products focus on? Every possible region that most people are not focusing on. That's been the whole ethos of our group. So when we talked about food and flavors, we talk, sometimes, as we said, sometimes India itself gets overlooked. But truth is, within India itself, there's tremendous diversity. How many people here can answer, what is European cuisine? How many, like, can you define all of Europe in three dishes? If you go to Spain, can you say that you've understood the cooking of Germany? You'll never say that. But we, ask yourselves, including me growing up in this country, we've always said, I've tried a few at an Indian restaurant. I know Indian food, we don't. And that's the most important thing to realize. There are regions within India that are grossly overlooked. And it all ties back to one specific factor, affluence. Whichever region has more money, more political power, will always have that food going out to the world where more tourists are coming. You're going to New Delhi, you're visiting the Taj Mahal, therefore that region is going to get a lot more focus, nicer hotels, you're staying there, you're starting to understand the region. Then you go to Bihar, Orissa, Meghalaya, and you're going to start to see the correlation. And that's the microcosm. The moment you zoom out to the rest of the world, you're going to see the exact same correlation happening. Countries with higher economic power has had their food reached at a higher level with more perceived value to those dishes. And that's one of the big things to understand. So what we are breaking through is, it's not just about cooking Indian food, but how do we bring that context? How do we really energize what our cuisine's about if we overlook a broad swath of the country? 
Does that answer your question? So guys, now when you see uh, this dough, it's a little crumbly over here, the flour, and then it's got a very different texture now. What has happened is that the fat has been rubbed inside the flour. So the flour is not together fully. There's a layer of fat between it. And we are going to create a dough now with this. So what happens technically is that when this dough is made, because, sorry, because there is no differentiation between the fat, fat is just, the shortening is just mixed inside, the gluten has been already formed. Even in this, the gluten will be formed, but what how it happens is that gluten is not uh, stringy like this. There is a small layer over there which is separating it, which is a fat, and when we are going to fry it, that oil or the shortening creates a steam and that will puff up a little bit up. You know, it will puff the entire dough up and we have the samples for people to try once we are frying it to see how two different doughs will actually fry. And if you see this dough, this is totally different in texture and the way it looks. We'll pass it on the dough once it's done. So one of the things we'll try is look at the microscope and see whether we can see the difference. There must be something that's visible. I don't know whether we can see it just with an optical microscope and what even an expert like Daniel can do today. But it's certainly something that we ought to be able to see somehow in case anybody should be interested as a project. The idea is when we talk about techniques, what Chef mentioned earlier, we tend to read, where does our knowledge come from? Most of us are consuming that, minus social media, most of us are consuming that from books. Understand, the cultures that documented it have gotten the books written. <coughs> Therefore, your knowledge, your source of its, uh, information is actually coming from a specific segment of the world that has actually done a better job of documenting it. That doesn't mean that other cultures never figured it out. Ideas like these have existed for centuries. Our moms, you know, aunts, my father, every single person has somehow, you know, incorporated all of these things. But what we don't have in Indian cuisine, let's say you think of a specific French dish, you might find the exact specific <laughs> recipe of how to do it. But if you're going to talk about some of the dishes you might know, sag paneer, there will be hundreds of recipes. And every time you go to a different household, it will vary. But the techniques, the fundamentals of it remain the same. It's really how we improvise, we create our own. And we think in many ways, there's a beauty to it. There's not the sterile nature of what food has become, but in many ways, each household has their own expression towards what they want to do. So guys, what we have, sorry, what we have over here are the two doughs. So the one, the one you see here is the one with the technique. The one, this is the regular one. Here we go. Sorry, you had a question? Yeah, it seems like uh, you're talking a lot about um, like the documentation. Do you think there's a, a cultural reason why the documentation in like India wasn't as good as in Europe? I, I'll answer your question. I think it also lies in... I, I just gave this example yesterday because we also had a lot of uh, uh, subcontinent crowd which will relate to it. And when I give this example, you might not even understand and you might think I'm just saying this. Uh, it might be due to a lot of insecurity. And I'll give an example, like my grandmother would make, my mother's mother would make a specific dish. Let's say she made the best uh, lentils. And everybody knows that, oh, the grandma makes the best lentil. So when my mother will ask my, her mother to give her the recipe, she might give her 95% of the recipe and she'll miss out on that 5%. And this goes down generation to generation. And it's, it's, it, this example is I'm giving my family example, but I've spoken to so many people because one of the part of what I do is I cook Indian food and I'm very inquisitive about doing a lot of uh, research on it. And I've realized that every time the person itself will say that, you know, my mother used to cook it that way. She has given me the recipe, but it still is not that one. And that's what I realized that this is what exactly happens. So the chain follows like that. And I think to create that demand for themselves as an individual, 
the recipe was never documented. So even if you go to an Indian restaurant today, you speak to someone, what do you add? You'll be like, yeah, I just add some things. I just add little spices here and there. They won't be very specific because they want to keep that technique to them. But now obviously the things are changing where a lot of people are trying to, you know, standardize everything. And that will actually take it forward. Um, and just to add on to what he said, you also have to look at the political climate of a country to understand why certain things happened, why it didn't. So think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The moment your own security, sanity, all of that starts to be turbulent, documentation of a cuisine becomes not that important because survival is at stake. So you start to look back, colonial powers, independence, infighting, where East Pakistan, Pakistan is splitting from India. So you really have a really hard history for the past few hundred years that has taken a, a, a big toll on us. And on top of that, you've had another problem. As a subcontinent, you haven't really had a unified voice. So in many ways, when it's a smaller nation, you can have a more unified voice from that specific country to say, this represents India. But in India, within those states, within 1.4 billion people, when I was growing up, 80s, you know, for me, going out to another state or another part of the country, it almost felt foreign. I didn't speak the language, I didn't know the food, I, people dressed differently. So it's the same context, it's just, history told us Europe is one continent, but India is a country, so we always considered it the same. But I think there's radical differences that existed. All of that contributed to us never really having that kind of a philosophy of really getting things documented. Perfect. And the entire concept of this, as, as a kid, I used, to, uh, I used to be, because I was the younger kid in the family, to run the, all the errands and everything, I was that person. So every time we had a guest at home, I would be asked to go and grab some samosa from the stall nearby. So I would walk there, and the funny thing about that place was that they used to make samosas in batches. So let's say they make 30, 35 samosas. So if you went there and you ordered and you were in the line, you'll get it in that batch, but if, it, no, if it's finished, the next batch would take 30, 35 minutes more. So as a kid, I never understood it. Why would it take so much time? Because frying for me was a simple concept where you put something in, fries at a high temperature, it comes out. So I never got it. And it was always that question in my mind. And over the period of years when I became a chef, and I was exposed to a lot of, you know, not only cooking, but the science of dining and science of food, I happened to come across a phenomenal book which changed my life. It's called On Food and Cooking, written by Mr. Harold Maggie, who was actually giving a lecture two weeks back over here. So he's a big inspiration in my life. <clears throat> and that book actually taught me what was the entire science behind doing that samosa right. And that was this simple thing. This was a simple thing which was happening and how to fry it at different temperatures and why that small guy in that stall was frying it for 35 minutes. He didn't use science about that product, but he knew what needs to be done to get and achieve that right. So these were very finer steps and because we have so much access to information that we can learn that and not that poor person actually. Okay, uh, we're gonna rest this for some time. In the next five minutes, I'll call two more people to roll it out and we are gonna fry it over here. Who wants to come and do the rolling and frying? Please, ma'am, come. One of you, one of you, one of you. <laughs> you know, as we discuss all these topics, understand that it kind of goes back to the very ethos of what science is. There might be a samosa maker out there that's better than him. He's a well-known chef. That doesn't mean that that person who might not have all the glory in the world, might not be on the cover of a magazine, hasn't figured out how to make a better samosa. And I say that with utmost humility. Never let those preconceived notions guide you towards who's better and who's worse. It's really about if, that, if you, it doesn't matter any of us, just focus and spend our attention towards one specific goal, it might make us better than anybody else in the world. So it's not about how much of higher education or not, but it's the resourcefulness that has driven a lot of these cuisines, and it's the same exact philosophy that all of us need to keep in mind whenever we think of the idea of science to The samples.
So guys, this is the regular door that we have. Uh, what we have over here is an oil which is at a temperature of 300 degrees. You're gonna fry the first batch in, which is the regular one, and then we go with the one which is with the shortening, uh, the short press method. So this, please start rolling, ma'am. It's okay, perfect, don't worry. We are not gonna make people taste that. We are tasting <laughs> Roll it, yeah. So, if you notice this, as she's rolling this dough, because the gluten is formed, it will go and come in, it will give in contradicting it. So guys, we have two samples over here. These are exactly fried the way we have done this dough and we are uh, giving it out. Uh, just a minute, I'll have to see which one is which. So the ones with the blue tags, are they correct? Yeah. Those are the correct. The ones with the blue, these are the correct ones, these are the ones which are done hastily. <laughs> so have a look and you'll see when you taste them, you'll, you'll see the difference in texture. And that's what we're trying to figure out why that's happening. Guys, please, any questions you have, you can keep on asking us. Yes, sir? I have a question. Um, is there any relationship between the cast that you were born into? I, I can't hear you, sir. Right. Hi. Is there any relationship between the cast that you were born into and the cuisine that you be in India? Sure. The cast that you're born into and the cuisine. Oh, yes, 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 yes. There's a there's lot of, like, that plays the most important role. When you look at food as such across the world, across the entire, you know, like across the entire world, all the countries, the food has always been determined what, what excess you have. So it was not only the cost, it was also what excess you have. Today it's a different time, you can order something on Amazon, you might get it in four hours, right? That was not possible before, like centuries back or long time back. So it was always dependent on what community where you grew up and what was the resources around it. So everything will be dependent on that. So if you think of India, for example, if you look at the bottom part of the map, it's like a V shape and there's Indian Ocean. So whenever you're near the coastline, you're going to have more seafood, you're going to have more coconut, uh, you know, okay, the climate, the humidity, all of that played a role. And of course, then the specific cast for sure. Someone would might be vegetarian, someone might not. Yeah, like spares or lasagna. I had a very important food uh, writer who asked me, he says, you guys are serving pork in your restaurant. Do Indian people eat pork? And I said, if you add up all the people in India that eat pork, we might be larger than a lot of other countries out there. So because it's not talked about, we don't really get a chance to understand it, but it's all spread out, and it's a ginormous population. So guys, as you eat these, who's had them? What's the difference? Explain them what the difference is. <laughs> Come on, guys. They're different. What's different? Look at them. <laughs> the incorrect one is a lot more crunchy. Crunchy, yes. What else? The correct one feels a bit more like from What about the, the, the way they look, the texture, yes. Um, the incorrect one has some really big holes in it. Big holes in it, right. It has lots of holes. It's really airy. I look at them, I see one's really thick, the other one's really thin. It's the same amount of material. One's thickened up, right? Is that the right way of describing it? Just yes. So what has happened with one of them is that it's just a regular dough, this one, and it's just fried. So it's thin and crisp. Come around and look at your creation. I'm looking at it. Okay, great. Okay. Oh, wow. I have to do it. And what's happening is it's just thin and crisp because there is no pocket of that fat. And when there's a pocket of fat and it's frying, that pocket of fat, because it's getting heated up, and it's cold, it releases the steam, which makes that dough a little bit fluffy. That's what's exactly happening. Yo, we see both of them. Come on, you start rolling this. Wow. 
the cutting part. So what does it look like, guys? Much more little air pockets, right? It's much airier, right? So this is the amazing thing to me. What is it that's mixing, just to the way he mixes them, makes it, when it fries, have much more air inside? What's causing that? I actually have a question. I don't have the answer for that. I don't either. I thought you were going to answer for me. <laughs> um, how does the butter make steam since like, butter has a very low water content in it? And I don't think the fat can come a gas easily. I think, and I, I don't know. I mean, this is why I think it's a great project. I think it's the water. I think the water is boiling, and the pressure of the steam as the water turns to steam is expanding. And I think what must be happening is it's trapped. When he rubs it, he's rubbing the gluten around the water, or he's rubbing something that will trap the water. That's what I think. So that's what, what I'd like to see if we can see when we look at the dough itself. I don't know if we can, but that's what I think is happening. That's the only way I can understand it. But again, I haven't done any experiments. It's such a great thing to look at. What a project. I, I'll just take this over for a minute to show them something. Uh, can I? Perfect. Now look at this dough. This is the dough which is with the shortening method. This dough, because gluten is not formed and like, you know how the uh, professor was explaining that when you hold the hands together in coagulation of egg, it's not letting it grow. So what's happening over here is, I think that coagulation has not happened. And I just learned it when you said this and I was trying to relate to it. Like, look at this dough, where the gluten is formed. If I do this, it comes back. See this? Now look at this dough. It breaks. It's breaking. When I pull it, it's breaking. You see this? Now this dough, it takes longer elasticity. Look at this. So this is the exact example of what you're saying where it's holding the hands together. So this one is holding the hands, difficult to tear it apart. This one, the gluten is formed, but it's not sticking to each other. So that's why when you do this, it just breaks. <coughs> and if you see at this one, this is on its own like this, but if I use this dough and rolled it, she was doing it, we just keep on coming back. So you'll have to keep on doing it and pushing it further. And there must be some relationship between that, I think, and how the water is held in place when he adds the water, which, when he fries it, leads to this very, very different texture. That's the only interpretation I can have right now. Yes? Makes sense? It makes sense? That's a good explanation. I mean, look, guys, I don't know. We're trying to understand. This is what science is all about, trying to figure it out. So that's as good an explanation as mine. Absolutely. What I'm trying to do is look at it and see. That's the only thing, the only thing we can do simply. And so Daniel will look at the dough itself and see if we can see that. Picture. But that's exactly right. What's going on? How can we understand it? That's a good explanation. It's as good as mine. The only thing that we could really do is try and prove it one way or another. And technically the method is, uh, it's not one is European, one is Asian or Indian. It's technically the same method, different names. It's just, you know, when, in, when it comes down to Indian cuisine, we just have a very specific name for it. That's really it. But universally, you've really had a lot of different cuisines that has used methods like these. Sorry, someone had a question back there. Yes. Um, my mom used to do it without any diet, and she added diet, and it was kind of like... Ma'am, can you just give the microphone? Like, yeah. 
Yeah. Louder. Speak more into the microphone. Two old guys be that much louder than you guys. Come on now, let's hear it. Come on. So yogurt is uh, yogurt is a very different property altogether. I don't know the chemical composition of that, but a lot of things when you're making a bread, a roti is a bread, you know. So when you make a chapati, it's a very different kind of a bread. It's a flatter bread. It's a thinner bread. But as soon as you, you add the yogurt to it, it becomes more like a paratha kind of a thing. And yogurt, as it's like it's a, it's a yogurt is a dairy based product, which actually gives softness to a product. So that's what it does to the dough. And as you see how slowly these are being fried, a lot of us, I don't do this at home, I'm going to crank up the heat because I'm in a rush, I'm going to fry things as fast as possible, and that's when you get that bad samosa. And you don't want to be a bad samosa, do you? <laughs> And what is the temperature, Chef? The, this one is at 300 degrees right now. Very different. This is fascinating. I've never seen this under a microscope myself. Never. Okay. So we're trying. This sorry. Is, this is the right, the right one. The, or the, the Can you just confirm if he has the right or the wrong one? Okay. No, it's the two wrong. Yeah. Oh, that's the right dough you were saying. Yeah. So it's got a lot more. It's got a lot more. Um, a lot more drops on it. We'll see. So it has smaller um, sort of water. The dough itself looks very dense in this, if you see. Yeah. The other one, the dough didn't look so dense. Yeah, and that's and that's that's how they look on the slide too. That's yeah. The wrong one and the right one. It's more yeah. Isn't that the surface of the moon? I'm really confused. <laughs> <laughs> look what you're cooking. Look at that. <laughs> so my speculation, my speculation is those those drops that are trapped as they boil away, they expand and they're trapped there and they expand the dough. That's what I think is happening. You had a slightly different interpretation, and I, I don't know whether you're right or, or I'm right. I don't know. This is, this is what doing science is all about, guys. Trying to figure it out. Yes? Oh, were you just waiting until the temperature was the same for the oil both times? Yes. Yes. Got it. Guys, come on, more questions. We actually had more questions yesterday than today. I was actually at a sleepless night because I was briefed that this class is going to bombard questions on you left, right, and center. <laughs> you get to ask questions if they don't. <laughs> right. Yes, sir. Does this happen with baking? Because you're demonstrating with frying. Yes. Same thing happens when you bake also. It's, it's the same thing. Uh, fluffier. Yeah. And I think what happens with baking is you bake it normally at the same temperature. So obviously the product will be different. It's, the qualities are still similar, but it comes out, the product still comes out nearly similar. But we use it as frying because as I said that it's a very old cooking technique and we didn't have access to ovens. You know, so the ovens actually became accessible in India, I would say, ovens were there always. I'm not saying they were not there, but when I say accessible is like when a common family could get it, would have been 90s or something. Like refrigeration, same thing. Refrigeration became a part of our entire household commonly by 90s, not before that. Yes, sir. When you when you started preparing the dough, you said you started with cold water as opposed to warm water. There, yeah. What's the reason for that? So what happens is whenever you use the fat, like I use the oil this time, but if you are using a butter <laughs> or uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That was intentional. <laughs> no. So when you use a butter or a vegetable fat or a lard, it will start melting if you add hot water to it. Uh, 
Um, I, this is a little bit hard to have uh, kind of art in our home. So what would you say is a good way to kind of replicate that effect with the door? What people might have at home? Somebody will have to repeat the question for me, sorry. Speak up. Since most of us don't have a tendor in our house, how would you kind of replicate that effect? So, it's, you are not the less fortunate one. We don't have tandoors at home. Uh, I don't know, those who don't know, tandoor is like a charcoal oven, which basically is, the smallest one you'll get is 34 inch by 34 inch. And it will be at least 1,000 pounds. Yeah, it depends on sort of the size. Yeah, it's it's, it's like a heavy thing, it's a very heavy equipment. Even in India, you don't have tandoors at home. And the concept of tandoor started in the northern state of India called Punjab, uh, where what would happen is, just think as a housing colony, so all the houses are around, and you'll have a tandoors in the center where the women of the house in the evening will get the dough and hang out and make the breads over there. So uh, that is the first part of it. So tandoor at home, some people have it who love that, who can afford to have it and cook over there, that's fantastic. But not everybody has it. And the second part is that if you don't have tandoor at home, you can always use a oven. And the, the <laughs> fundamental cooking difference in tandoor to any other cooking medium like a grill, basically it's a grill, it's a charcoal grill. The basic fundamental difference is the surface. So what happens in tandoor, those who don't know is, uh, it's basically a cube like this, and then there's a, oh, I can do here, sorry. So, So let's say it's something like this, it's a, it's a thing, and then you have an opening over here, and this thing is basically like, it's sort of shaped like this, this is how it looks inside, and you basically have the steel covering outside, this is filled up with glass wool, the reason there's glass wool inside this is because it's a bad conductor of heat, and it helps the heat to be retained inside, it doesn't absorb the heat, and over here, you have form of fire. So in America, what happens is normally tandoors that you get are gas fire, which are very easy to manage in everything. In India, we use wood charcoal. There are two kinds of charcoal. You have rock charcoal and wood charcoal. You don't use the rock charcoal in tandoor. You use the wood charcoal in tandoor. So you'll basically fill up your thing with charcoal over here and, and there's a opening over here which you keep on opening and closing for air to pass to control your heat. So when you, when you want the heat to crank up, you open the lid, the air will crank up the heat. When you want to control the heat, you get the right temperature, you just shut it off. So this is the wood charcoal over here, it's normally this thing. And then you have something called as skewers, and we call it seek. <coughs> seek, which are basically stainless steel skewers like this. You also get iron, but stainless steel are more clean and hygienic. And what you do is you poke in your meat inside it. So let's say this is a piece of a meat which is marinated and you just get inside like this and this thing goes inside. So when it goes inside, the pointing, pointier portion is down and then on top you have a hook like this. This stays outside, this is how you are gonna control it. The meat is on top of this. And it could be any kind of meat, it could be chicken, seafood, vegetables, uh, lamb, beef, anything that you want. It's over there and then you cook it with it, keep on controlling it. Okay? And you also do, the person who had a question about the naan bread, sir, naan bread? Yeah. Naan bread is cooked inside this. And it's slapped on the wall. Right. So what happens is you form a dough and then there's a pillowy thing which is like a small pillow and you put the naan on it and you stick it on the wall. So what happens is, because of the heat over here, it will cook the back side of the bread, and because of the heat from the front, it will cook the front side of the bread. And appearance-wise, there are two different things, because the back, because it's on the heat itself, will be little brownish, darker brownish. This one will have little bit bubbles and whiter on the side. So this is the one which is always shown to you in a picture. Okay. Does it answer the question, sir? And keep in mind, I think the usage of yogurt and marination is sort of, it goes hand in hand with how a tandoor operates. 
because the heat is not direct, you're not touching the skewer or the protein is not directly on a metal surface, a yogurt will burn. But because of this being from the side, it's not in direct contact with any metal, it's okay. And that's why a lot of the yogurt marination works really well in the tandoor as it might in a typical barbecue grill. Right. And the reason I said you can use oven is because oven will did still give you leverage where, let's say, uh, okay. let's say that's an oven and you're going to cook it inside. So you can use a tray for it. And what you do is you use a little deeper tray like this and you can just place your skewer on top of it and you can have meat like this. Uh, you might ask me a question and this is a lot of people ask me that, why not grill? Why don't you use grill to cook the kebab because this is a grill. What happens with grill difference is, let's think this is a grill <coughs> and you know you'll have grills like this, right? When you are cooking anything on a grill, the meat is touching the surface. So what happens is whenever we cook meat in America, mostly like the grills like the steaks, you're going to put steaks, you're going to put it on the grill directly, but it doesn't have any marination. And whenever it also has a marination, it's an oil-based marination. While when you're doing the kebabs, it's a yogurt-based marination. As soon as the yogurt sticks to this, within five seconds, it will burn, it will turn black. So your product, when you eat it, the final kebab will be a little bitter. And you'll say, oh, when I ate this chicken tikka in a restaurant, it was very different from this because I used still the same recipe. Why is it like this? They used the grill, we used the grill. What's the difference? The difference is the surface area. It's not touching anything. Here, it's directly touching it and yogurt is burning. So if you want to do a kebab, which is an oil-based marination with dry rub, it will work here also and here also. But a yogurt-based a yogurt marination only works over here and that's why when you put it in the oven, it needs to go like this. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, so I have a question, again, about unqualified foods. And I was wondering if in your research and your focus, you do any work looking at how colonization has impacted Indian foods, because some of the more popular foods, like papachi or gobi manchurian, have like distinct um, Eastern or Western influence. So have you looked at how that influence has impacted cuisines as a whole or like where that interaction actually happened? So to a certain extent, but I think that also brings up a really valid and exciting question. We as a company, it's more than just a group of restaurants. And I would really encourage if these are topics that are and questions that are really exciting. We would love to explore deeper. There's a certain level of knowledge that we are operating from. But to extend that, we would really encourage any of you, if you're interested, reach out to your professors. We would love to see if there's a way that we can work together to really create a, a fantastic idea to do research on. And I think these questions can be answered in a way that none of us have really approached. And I think these are real answers that we can create. But yes, to your point, you know, the cuisine gets impacted each time there's been a different influence from somewhere else that has come in. So if you look at India, the invasion of the Mughals, and you start to go on to the colonial roots, and you then start to go into independent India, there's been very distinct elements. The Portuguese comes to Goa. You know, you have the French that are in Pondicherry. And each and every single time the cuisine has shifted, but it has shifted not in a similar fashion. She mentioned a dish called Gobi Manchurian. Now this is a dish that came from the early 1700s. A group of settlers from China walked, you know, uh, from China all the way to Calcutta, where you know, my home state is. And when they settled, they started to incorporate a lot of Indian ingredients along with Chinese ingredients and gave birth to what all Indians understand as Chinese food. And in reality, it's Indo-Chinese. So that became this beautiful synergy. Whereas in other cases, Pao came through the Portuguese. Pao is a word that means bread in Portuguese and that has become part of our culture in the, in the time of industrialization because we needed something fast to create. So how those influences have happened has been radically different from one another. But have they happened? Yes. Every country that has touched India in many ways have left their fingerprints. And today's version of Indian food isn't really where it all started. It has really evolved and shifted in many ways to reach this point. Great question. And 
See, what happens is, if you look at it, like we were speaking to somebody who writes about food, that like one of the most common dishes in uh, you know Italian food they are saying is uh, spaghetti with meatballs, right? But when this guy was researching about it, he said that actually there's no dish called spaghetti with meatballs. It was only spaghetti in a kind of a sauce. But the early Italian settlers, 150 years or 125 years back in New York, created this dish because they wanted to crank up the value of that dish. So they added the meatballs to it. And now it's one of the dishes which defines the food, the Italian cuisine. So it keeps on changing. And same goes for Gobi Manchurian, as he said that it's, it's a Indo-Chinese food. There's actually a cuisine in India which is called Indian Chinese food. And it's totally different. It's not the food from the mainland China. There's a totally different Indian version of the Chinese food. And that's authentic because it's been now cooked for at least 80, 90 years. Yes, sir. What did you flavor the dough with that we tried? So uh, that's got flour, salt, a little bit of oil, no, sorry, oil, water, and the one over here has got carom seeds. Carom, ajuan, that's the Hindi name for it, carom. So the property of carom seeds, is, so the entire Indian cooking is based a lot on Ayurveda, which is a you know, form of healing and everything. And all the spices that are used have a certain kind of a medicinal property. So every time something that was fried, they would add inside it ajwain because ajwain is actually a flatulent. So if you generate a lot of gas eating that thing, it was called a kind of a flatulent. You understand? And even like there's, there's a thing called uh, grandmother's tips. So if as a kid I would go and say to my grandmother that my tummy is paining, she would actually give me like a pinch of ajwain with warm water to have it. And that would cure it. So that's why we add ajwain into this. And then, oh. Excuse me, just for a minute. You know, there are a lot of really good projects that I'm sensing here, both from understanding the cultural side and how science has influenced that, or understanding how some of the science does, uh, works on this. And I just asked Ronnie, they'd be very excited to, uh, to work with you guys if you want, and you, know, you might be able to visit them uh, and work with them as well as part of the project. It's always an opportunity. Absolutely. If there's people who are rule breakers, feel free to jump in. It's, it's what we do on a daily basis. It's our life. And, you know, one of the big things we've been looking at is maybe the reason we have been standing out in many ways. Indian food has been served here for God knows how long. In early 1900s on, you're seeing Indian food. But we have been just doing one thing. We're just questioning things. We're just saying that maybe how things have been might have been great, but what if there was a different perspective? We're not here to claim that all Indian food should be unapologetic. We're here to say that at least one voice that should exist is unapologetic. You can express it, it's like art. You can express any cuisine any way you want to, but at least the real way should not be overlooked, and that's the only way that we've, we've always overlooked. Yes. Uh, are you, did you change the temperature on the second try? Yes. So we got it. So first temperature was for 300. The second temperature is 400. Maybe you can so what happens is the first one is you are actually cooking the dough and everything inside. The second one is just to give that color. Is there a reason why you put the second sieve over the first one? Like this one? Yeah, why do you put oh, the second one? So you see this, it comes on top. So it doesn't evenly do that color. That's why I just place it. The only same question which I had from yesterday was this one. <laughs> Why do you have it on top of it? Seriously, this is the sa same question, yeah, except all the questions are so different, like it was a different band of people, totally different questions, today totally different questions, except this one. <laughs> uh, were you sitting yesterday also? No? <laughs> all right, uh, don't forget the opportunity so, the coffee. Yeah, so this yes. is, let's well, try this under the microphone. Coffee though afterwards, go ahead. Sorry. Let's try this under the microscope. Yep. So this is the regular one. This is the special one done with the method. That's the regular one.
Should we break it open? Every time I look at a microscope, I feel like I'm in an astronomy class. <laughs> This is just freshly cooked? Yeah. So you can see it glistens a lot more, right? It's much more reflective. Right? There's still a lot of oil there. You see this layering of the dough over here? This one? It's totally different from the other one. This is the older one. So this is what casta is. This is literally what a short crust is. This is the casta. As you see, it's like broken in the chains over there. It's like crystals inside. Yeah. Why is it whiter? Do you understand? Why is it whiter? Anybody have any ideas? I don't know. Why is it white? So you see, there's a lot of white parts that you don't see in the other one. It's a very different texture, a very different I, I think also what happens is if it stays for longer, it will still cook it further because it's hot. So there's a process in cooking called as overcooking, or what does what does that mean is that let's say when you're frying a thing or you're cooking something, uh, your desired color is to achieve this, you need to stop cooking it a little bit further. Because what happens is, because the heat inside will keep on cooking it further. So what we have over there was actually cooked on Sunday night. And it has remained inside that. Obviously it takes the next 15, 20 minutes till the time it cools down, still cooking inside. Any more questions, guys? Yes, last one. Um, I'm wondering if you ever have to compromise your authentic Indian recipes to make it sought after and like popular by Americans. The whole reason why we exist is because we haven't compromised. <laughs> That's the whole reason. It's it's. She says if you ever had to compromise to cater to sort of a different palate, etc., uh, or a different audience. I'll just answer one thing. If we ever compromised, we wouldn't be invited to be here. <laughs> and I genuinely want to come back and take one more lecture. So I wouldn't compromise. <laughs> well, thank you. A big round of applause.